Oh man, Caleb and Stone and our youth team have been running with their hair on fire this summer. On fire. They've done so much for our kids. I'm so grateful for them pouring into our kids and Kayla and all of her team for our kiddos. But man, you guys, summer, what's up? It's coming to an end. Oh, that's sadness to my soul. I'm not going to, I feel like it just warmed up for crying out loud. Back to school, anybody? Whew. Yeah, it's been a summer. Anybody else? It's been a summer. Whew. It has been a summer. Well, this is, um, this is actually a summer that I will remember, man, for the rest of my life. This is the summer that I lost my mom. My mom went home to be with Jesus uh, back, in, back in June. And, um, and my, my sweet mom, she just, her sweet little body just gave out on her. She was about to be 83. Uh, so she was just, she was still 82. And man, I, almost all you would hear from her in her last days, last couple years, was I just wanna go home. Why, why won't God just take me home? Why won't God just take me home? Why am I still here? Why am I still here? And I'm like, well, mom, you, you still have a story to tell and you've still got some prayers to pray. So, so you're, gonna, you're obviously gonna be here for a little bit. But she just slowly declined. We got her into an assisted living place back in March, April. And she just, and God just, it, mercy, just, she did go very fast. And she went home in her sleep, which is what she actually asked for, which was really, really sweet. Um, but now she's home. Now she's home with Jesus. And, and so as you do, if you've had the loss of a parent, uh, you end up going through their home and, and looking at all their things and sorting and making decisions about all the things that are in their home. And I would tease her and I would laugh with her. And I'm like, mom, you know, I'm going to have to go through all this stuff that's, that's sitting here in your closets and your, your things. And, and she would just kind of laugh. She's like, yeah, that's going to be on you and not on me. So, and so that's what I did. So that's what I, I spent um, quite a bit of May and June kind of just going through all of her things. And, and she, she collected uh, several different items, one of which that should never be ignored is she had this thing for little tiny footstools, little tiny footstools. She would just go to garage sales and everywhere. And I count, I gathered them all up in the middle of her living room at one point before we donated them back to Goodwill. And, and I counted 27 of them. <laughs> 27 little stools that she had just collected through all the years and, and all the books and all the clothes and all the things and all the things. But one of the things that, that kind of took me by surprise, which I knew a small part of, but didn't realize fully, were notebooks. And notebooks like, just like this, notebooks that she would write on kind of maybe who it was to or what it was about. My name is on this one, and that's her name, in case I had any questions as to whose notebook it was. And it says, my writings from July 2011. And I found boxes and notebooks. I'm not exaggerating when I say anywhere between 40 to 50 of these notebooks filled. And, and not just like, oh, maybe I'll just write and then I forget and so I start a new one. No, filled with words, and not just words scripture and prayers, things she would be praying for me, things that she would be praying for my family, for my brother, for his family, for our world, for the president, what, whatever was going on decades and decades full of notebooks. And so, I, I mean, even, I just opened up this one the other day and, and she writes down here and she wrote, each day I tell God, I want my life to glorify you today, God. Help me do that, God, thank you. And she would just write prayers over and over again and just fill up journals over and over again, all over her house. What a legacy, what a legacy. As I, as I would go through them, I'm like, what a gift. What a gift to see that my mom just loved the Lord. My mom just loved the Lord. And I'll tell you more about how she came to know Jesus a little bit later on. But this morning, if my mom was here, if she would have the ability to come in here and, and say anything to you, it would be, Jesus is so worth it. He's so worth it. And it's worth whatever it takes, whatever it takes for you in your own life, whatever it takes for you to lead your family, to lead this next generation to know him, it is so worth it. It is worth the grind. And because parenting, and I've said this a lot, it's no joke. It is no joke being a parent or helping raise up our next generation because the stakes are so high and the love, if you can get past it, the love that we have for those kids, oh my word, 
There's nothing that compares to the love that we have for those kiddos that God has entrusted with us. And throughout her life, my mom, my mom had a story to tell and she had prayers to pray. And she would tell us to do the same. She would say to you this, we have a story to tell and we have some prayers to pray. We have stories to tell to the next generation of how God has worked in our lives. And we have prayers as we seek his face and pray for this next generation to rise up and praise him as well. God wants us to tell our stories because they matter. And you might be sitting in here this morning and go, I don't, I don't know, I, don't, I think you're over I think you're overselling my, my story here. But it matters. Your story absolutely matters. And you have prayers to pray. And maybe this morning you're like, I don't know. I don't know if prayer matters. I don't know if my prayers are even making a difference. They do. And we're going to talk about that this morning because the stakes are so high. The stakes are so high. We've got kids, we've got teachers, all of, all of us shifting into that back to school zone. And it is intense. It is intense for our kids and it is worth it. It is worth it. And you have a story to tell and a prayer to pray. And we're going to talk about that this morning. And we are going to look, we're going to dive in here this morning. We're going to look at three different passages of scripture that reiterate this over and over again. This isn't just something that I'm making up, that Joel's making up. No, this is actually scriptural that we are to tell our stories and to pray for the next generation like, like it matters, like it actually matters. And so we're going to do that. We're going to jump into, Joel talked about this passage last week, and it is Deuteronomy 6. And it's Moses speaking kind of his last words. And again, we talked about how, how cool it is to just kind of hear people's last words. And this is what Moses had to say because it matters. It matters. And so we're just going to jump into Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 7. And again, it's Moses. And he starts off saying, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Not just flying around like some little distraction. No, on your hearts, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Every single moment as you just absorb these words that God has to say, you are to be impressing them upon your children. And then you jump down to verse 20 and it says this because, here's the why, here's the why. Because someday your children are gonna ask you why? Anybody have a kid ask them, ask you why? 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 Because that's what kids do. Someday your children are going to ask why? Why did the Lord give us these laws and teachings? And you're going to have an answer. Because we were slaves of the king of Egypt, but the Lord used his great power and set us free. We saw him perform miracles and make horrible things happen to the king. It was awesome. And the Lord rescued us from Egypt so that he could bring us into his land as he had promised our ancestors. Because your kids are going to ask why. So we're going to have an answer and we're going to tell them, this is the amazing stuff that God did. And we're not going to forget how amazing it was. We're going to know him. We're going to remember what he has done because we are a people who quickly forget. We forget. We just forget. We forget what happened. We forget what God had, had done. And so we're going to know him and we're going to remember him. And we're going to be a people who don't quickly forget because this is so easy to do. And we're going to jump ahead to our, to our next passage of scripture in Joshua chapter four so that we don't forget Joshua chapter four. And this is, this is Joshua. He's taken over from Moses. He's leading the people finally into the promised land. And it's a big moment. It's a big deal. And so Joshua wants to commemorate this moment by going, oh, we're going to remember this deal right here. And so he's talking to these 12 men and says this. We're starting off in, in verse 5 of chapter 4 of Joshua. Joshua's saying, go across to the middle of the Jordan. Each of you, each of you men, lift up a stone. Picture the scene. Lift up a stone onto your shoulder, one for each of the Israelite tribes, so that this will be a sign among you. Because in the future... Again, not, not if, but when. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Anybody have a kid go, what does this mean? What in the world is this? You're going to have an answer for them. You should tell them. 
The waters of the Jordan were cut off in front of the Ark of the Lord's Covenant when it crossed the Jordan. The Jordan's waters were cut off. Therefore, these stones will always be a memorial for the Israelites. Oh, we're going to remember and we're going to be able to tell them because kids ask why and what is going on. They're going to want to know. They're going to want to know. So we need to know, we need to remember, and we need to tell because we have a story to tell. We have a story to tell. And so then we're going to jump down to the third, the third um, section of scripture, which is Psalm 78. And it's one of my favorite Psalms. I love Psalm 78. I love the message about it. And the psalmist is picking up the same thing. Again, if we haven't gotten it from these past two, again, a third one, Psalm 78, starting off in verse one, and it says, oh, my people, listen, listen to my instructions. Open your ears to what I'm saying, for I will speak to you in a parable, which is another word for a story. I will teach you hidden lessons from our past, stories we have heard and known, stories our ancestors have handed down to us. That phrase right there, hidden lessons, it actually means something that we really don't understand, like almost dark. It actually, it, in, one, in a couple other translations, it says, we're gonna, we're gonna tell you some dark sayings. We're gonna tell you some things that maybe don't make sense. It's a conundrum. It's a cool word. Um, anything in your past don't, doesn't make sense, or it's kind of dark, it's kind of heavy, and you look at it and you're like, I don't, I don't know that I understand that. That thing that happened to me, I don't, I don't get it. But that's what the psalmist is saying, that we're going to teach you, we're going to teach the next generation these hidden lessons from our past, stories handed down. So we're going to pick it back up in verse 4 of Psalm 78. It says, we're, we're not going to hide these truths from our children. We're going to tell the next generations about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power his mighty wonders, for he issued his laws to Jacob. He gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children so the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born. So they, in turn, will teach their own children. So each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. Amen. Go back up to that verse four. We will not hide these truths from our children. We're going to tell the next generation that word hide there in the Greek means hide. It just means hide. We're not going to conceal these stories of how God worked in our lives. We're not going to hide these stories from our kids because we have a story to tell. Now, when I, when I think about stories, about telling stories to my kids, um, so Joel is my person. I go with him. We've been married for about 22 years. Um, and if you know Joel for a minute, dude's got some stories. The man has some stories. And so there will be moments, there has been moments over the past however many years we've had kids where he'll start to tell a story. And I'm, I'm like, I know where he's going with this story. And I'm like, no, 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 not that story. That's not, no, we don't want to tell them that you jump trains. No, stop. Shh. No, that's not the story we need to tell our children. Do you want them to do this? No. No, we don't. Just mm, not those stories. Or, or think about the, the culture that we live in. I, I, I've thought a lot. My parents were kind of that last generation before Oprah and talk shows where everybody just decided that everybody's going to tell everything all the time. Like on social media, I'll, I'll just tell you everything. I'll tell you about my latte. I will tell you literally everything about my life. That's the story I'm going to tell. This isn't the story that we're talking about out of scripture here. Not, not those stories. No, we're, we're talking about the goodness of God's stories. The stories of how God showed up. How God parted the Red Sea. How God took you out of Egypt and brought you into the promised land. And how he held back the Jordan so that you could cross over and over again. How have we seen God moving in our lives? because we have a story to tell. And sometimes I think we can think that our stories are just kind of small and insignificant. I mean, again, you might be overselling this, Julie. I don't, I don't know that I've got that big of a story. I don't have some big ministry or some big platform or some enormous story. I'm just average. I'm, I'm just trying to make ends meet, doing my best over here. I don't, I don't know that I've got that big of a story to tell. 
Or maybe there's other, other, others of us who are like, oh man, I've, I have got some stories. I, I, I don't know that the next generation needs to know about that story. Because it was a lot. There's a lot that went down. There's a lot that I did. It's, it's stuff that I might actually feel some shame about. It's not a good story. I've lied. Things that I did. Lies that I told, secrets that I kept. Why in the world would I ever want the next generation to know anything about all of that? Because all of it, honestly, just keeps me a little separated from God. Because shame about our stories separates us from God. Shame about things that we have done in the past, they separate us from God because we do. We want to turn our head and go, I don't, how can I live in, in a story, in a right story with God when I've got this, that I just, I kind of want to turn my head from his holiness about all that went down, all that secrecy or all that lie or, or whatever that, whatever that was. But if you have looked at anybody in the Bible at any given moment, nobody, I, I really, I did, I tried to think of different people in the Bible who might have an amazing story that didn't, that went untouched besides Jesus. And there's nobody, there's nobody in the Bible who's got anything that they're not maybe ashamed about or something didn't happen to them. I mean, you think of people who were caught doing the wrong thing. You think of David. My goodness, a man after God's own heart? Are you joking? That man was a mess. But he was. The Bible says that he was a man after God's own heart. And David had things that he probably was not very proud of. Think of Peter who denied Christ. I've denied Christ with my life. That separates me, that shame. And yet, and yet Jesus restored him. You think of the woman caught in adultery. Think how many times maybe you've heard that story or we've heard that story over generations, over generations in the middle of something that she would have surely been ashamed of. But God used her story in the next generation to bring people to him over and over again. God redeemed it. Think of the people who had horrible stuff happen to them. They weren't even responsible. Think of Joseph and his, colors, his colorful coat and how much his brothers hated him and sold him off. He didn't do anything wrong. He just ended up in jail over and over again. Just kept circling back, not because of something that he did wrong, but God came back and redeemed it. I think of Paul. He was, he was hurt and beaten within an inch of his life multiple times, but God came back and redeemed him. I think of, I thought this week about Mary. I think, oh man, Mary, she had her son brutally murdered right in front of her eyes. What does that do to somebody? And you didn't, you didn't try it. You, you didn't do anything to cause that. You just watched it happen. And over and over again, God comes along and redeems it because redemption is one of the best words ever. And God does it for all of us whether we cause pain or someone caused pain to us and we go, ah, my story, it's too shameful. Like, I, God redeems it over and over again. I can think of so many times God's done that in my life and maybe you can as well. And you know those words, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from unrighteousness. For as far as the East is from the West. That's how far he separates our sin from us. And when we seek him, he answers us and he delivers us. And those that look to him are, are actually radiant and their faces will never be ashamed. And that's why the psalmist tells us to tell our story because it's actually not our story. It's actually his story of his redemption in our life because actually everything in our life has the opportunity to point us and others to Jesus. Literally everything in our lives has the opportunity to point us and others to Jesus. Every pain, every misstep, every sin, every embarrassing moment, every wrong decision, every right decision. Because in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, it says, I would so much rather boast about my weaknesses because that's actually where Christ is the absolute strongest, is in my weaknesses. Because here's the deal. Your kids don't want to know that you're perfect. 
They don't want to know. They don't want to see. They don't need to see some perfect parent, nor do they think you are. Just in case you thought they might. Your kids don't actually think you're perfect. They know everything. They know it. What your kids want to know is that your God is real. That's what your kids want to know. That's what my kids want to know. Because they're going to ask those questions. Why in the world do we go to church every single Sunday? Why? What are, what's the purpose? What is the point? What's the point of you getting up and reading your Bible? What? Why does any of this matter to you, mom, dad, grandma, aunt, uncle? Why? Because it's not if they're going to ask those questions. It's just when. And they may not come to you. They may not come to me and ask that. But they want to know, is my God real to me? And do I have a story to tell? And am I praying for them? Because you have a story to tell. Regardless of your circumstances, you have a story to tell the next generation and it matters that you tell them. And so how, how, do, we do, how do we tell? How do we tell that story? How are we going to do that? One, I think we pay attention and take notice. I think a lot of times... We can tend to go, oh, I need some big, miraculous, God showed up, fire from heaven, and just like burned it all. I, and that happens. But what about the every single day stories of how God actually shows up in your life? I can think April through June in, in our life, in our family, April through June was bananas, absolutely insane. We had two kids graduating from high school, and it's... It's all the things. It's the graduation parties, the invitations, the announcements, all the things that I got to keep track of, all the things I got to pay for at the school that I haven't paid because they actually won't give them their sweet little diploma unless I pay every red cent that I owe the school. So it's taking care of all those checklists, getting them up to graduation, getting the outfits, making sure that you're there. All of it. It's crazy. Uh, Out-of-town guests coming in, my mom being at the point where she needed to go in an assisted living home. And how am I going to do that? Where are we going to put her? What are we going to do? And on top of that, we breed miniature golden doodles, and we had 14 puppies in our house during that same time period. So it was crazy. It was crazy. But I also knew, and I think it was because my mom was so close to going home, I just, I just said, God, I, I don't want to miss. And plus, your kid's graduating. I don't want to miss. I don't want to miss seeing them. I don't want to miss the moments that are going to be leading up to that. And God, I, I, can't, I can't even keep track of what's next. Would you, would you just show up and show me what's next? I'm going to do what you, what you have me do today. Whatever, you know, I've got a to-do list. Here's my, I don't even have the capacity to go ahead four days and, and plan this party. I, I, I don't. But can you show me today what I need to do? And I will tell you, the orchestration, and I don't use that term lightly, that orchestration between April through the end of June was unbelievable. The moments where he would show up and say, I want you to have that friend do that task for you. You don't need to do it. Your friend Lisa called to see if she could take this off your plate, let her. And she, and she did it. And the timing was so perfect. The conversation I had with my brother about things I was gonna, that we needed to do, conversations that we need to make preparations for for my mom just happen to be on this night that happened before this event and, and all the things with the party and the planning and the people and the, and the puppies, and they all went out the door. All the puppies went out, all of it. It just, and I got to the end of it, and I got to the end of June, and it all happened, and it was sweet. And I watched God move in just ordinary things. And I looked at my friend Lisa, and I'm like, do you think it's always like this, but we just miss it? Do you think it's always this orchestrated, but I'm so busy in the hurry and the worry and then let's go and what if and oh my gosh, I'm going to stress out. I'm going to stress out everybody else around me because what if it doesn't work? Is it, does God actually take the time to care enough to orchestrate our lives in the everyday mundane and I just miss it? And she looked at me, she's like, I think so. And I bet it's the same. And I've been trying since then to go, God, how are you showing up in my actual day today? Not in the great big bring in fire from heaven type things, even though we, we need those and we pray for them, but, but what story are you telling? What story are you telling here in the middle of August to each of us, to my life? How can I, how can I trust you in that? How can I pay attention and take notice of what you're actually doing in my, 
actual life. So let's take notice. That's how, we, that's how we start telling our story is to pay attention, take notice. Number two, thank God for how he showed up. Lord, thank you. Because it, it acknowledges, again, it's, it's not my story. It's his. It's 100% his. He caused that to work and, and that didn't work, but I'm still gonna praise him in it. I'm gonna thank him. God, thank you for how you showed up. So I'm going to pay attention, we're going to take notice, and we're going, to, we're going to thank how he showed up. And then number three, it's just simple. Recount that story with your kid, with that, with that young person in your life. Tell them, hey, this is, this is how God showed up. This is what happened. This is how, how I saw him show up. And it's just simple, and it seems so boring, but it meant everything to me. Here's the crazy mess we were in, but here's how God came through. Here's the crazy mess I made. But here's how God restored me. Here's the crazy mess they made. But look how God redeemed it. We just keep pointing our kids to Jesus and we tell the story because you have a story to tell. And we have prayers to pray. And we have prayers to pray. Oh, do we have prayers to pray? Because the stakes are high. The stakes are high and they are coming in hot for our kids. And I think our kids are desperate to see somebody who knows Jesus and can point them towards truth. And our kids are desperate to know that there is a truth and that they can stand firm on it. They know this. And there's no one way to pray for your kids. There's no one way that I pray for my kids. Maybe you've got your way, I've got my way. There's no one way to pray for your kids. I've done a myriad of ways. I've prayed with other moms. I've gotten together uh, different days and, and prayed with other moms for our kids, for our schools. I've prayed with my mom. Oh my goodness, did my mom pray for my kids. I've prayed with my mother-in-law. I've, I've prayed for my kids based on their circumstances. Whatever I know they're walking through right then, I will pray about that. I'll pray for their futures. I'll pray for their future spouses. I'll pray for their, all the things for their kids, for my grandkids. I will pray for that. I have walked my house. I've walked the circumference of my house. I've walked different rooms. Yes, I've walked in my kids' bedrooms and I have prayed over their rooms. I've stood outside, I've stood inside and I have prayed. There've been different books that I've taken. Maybe, maybe you need a book. Uh, there's, it's The Power of a Praying Parent by Stormy Omardian. She's amazing, I wore that book out. I wore that book out. This is my favorite right now. It's called Fervent by Priscilla Shire. It's, it's so good. And I just, I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna read it. I'll just read prayers for my kids and I'll just, I'll just pray the tar out of it because the stakes are so high and it is worth it. But then when all else fails, I'll pray scripture over my, over my kids because if it's in God's book, it must be truth. And if Jesus said it, or if, or if it's Holy Spirit ordained, it, it can't be bad, right? It's gotta be so good for my kids to pray actual scripture over them. And so I will. I will just take portions of scripture. There's been different ones that I've grabbed through the years, but there's two that I've come back to over and over and over again to pray over my kids. And maybe you can adopt some of this and pray them over your own kids. And they're, the two that I'm gonna talk about are both in Ephesians. Side note, ladies. We're doing a study in Ephesians this fall. Please join us. Please go online and sign up and be a part of our Ephesians study this fall. But I prayed two different prayers out of Ephesians 1. Uh, Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 3. And I will drop their names in. Or I will drop people that I know that are struggling in my house, in my family. I'll drop their names in. And Ephesians 1, 15 through 19 says this, for this reason, I too, having heard of the faith of the Lord Jesus, which exists among you and your love for all the saints, I don't, give, I don't cease giving thanks for you. While making mention of you in my prayers, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory will give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation. Don't we want our kids to have a spirit of wisdom and revelation in their lives and the knowledge of him? I pray that the eyes of your heart, my child, would be enlightened so that you would know the hope of God's calling on your life. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what are the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe? And I will drop in specific names when I'm praying this. 
And then this one in Ephesians, Ephesians 3. I've, I prayed that, th- I have prayed this this week, just a couple days ago. I will walk my floor. I've got kids that, that sleep in the basement. I've got kids that sleep upstairs. And depending on where I'm at in the house, I will just pray this over my babies who are not so little anymore. And I will pray for this reason, I bow my knee before the father from whom the Thomas family derives its name. And I pray that my kids, God, they they would be granted according to your riches to be strengthened with power through your spirit in their inner being so that Christ would dwell in their hearts through faith and that they would, who are rooted and grounded in love would be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth that my kids would know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge and that they would be filled up to the fullness of God in their lives. And then this part is the best. Now to him who is able to do more than I can think about or worry about or pray about. He can do more than I can ever ask or think according to the power that works within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to every single generation forever and ever because we have a story to tell and we have prayers to pray for our kids because it matters because the stakes are that high. I'm going to ask the band to come up as we, as we wrap up this morning. Since my mom passed, um, I had just a really sweet opportunity to go back to Rapid City, South Dakota, which is where I grew up. Um, I got to go up there and I just did it. I did it kind of like a nostalgia tour. I got up there and, and I just wanted to go see everything again. I just, I just wanted to see everything. So she had passed and it was probably about a month later that I got to go up there this summer and I got to just really, I, I did everything. I went past all my old houses, all the schools that I went to, elementary, middle high, uh, middle and high school and um, different places that, that we'd gone, the church that we went to. I went, I went and just did the whole tour and it was so sweet just to see all, I hadn't been up there in, in quite a few years. And I got to this house that, that I grew up in probably from age, well, from age zero to about age 10 or 11. And I totally looked like a stalker. I, I, somebody could have reported me, but I stood, I stood outside this house and it's just this little square box of a house. Of course, when I was little, it was like the biggest thing ever, but I'm standing outside the house and I, I'm looking in and I, I see, and I recount like, okay, that, that window was for that area and that, that window. And, and God just reminded me of something really sweet. I stood there and I looked at this window and I'm like, that was my mom and dad's bedroom. And I recalled, God brought to mind that there was a night when she was 32 years old. 32 years old. My mom was watching the television. She was watching Billy Graham. And she was watching Billy Graham. And Billy Graham, through the power of the Holy Spirit, came through that television. And Billy Graham asked a question that he would ask anybody. Wouldn't you just give your life to Jesus because he's worth it? Wouldn't you just give everything to follow Jesus because he's so worth it? And she said, yes. And so I, I thought in my mind, obviously I was, I was like five, so I, didn't, I, don't, I can't actually see it, but I pictured this 32 year old woman because she told me, she would tell the story. She would get on her knees. She said, I got on my knees and I asked Jesus to be my Lord and my savior that night. And it changed everything. It changed everything in our family. It changed everything in my life. She started taking me to the First Baptist Church. And I went there and I got saved. I got baptized at eight years old. And it changed everything for me. Because my mom kept telling me her stories. And she kept praying for me. And she filled notebooks full of prayers. And she handed down a very unique legacy to me. We are not unlike that. What story do you have? What story can you tell? What prayers can you start praying for your kids, for this next generation? Because the enemy is after our kids, y'all. 
the stakes are high and the enemy and this world would love to take them out. And that is not, I am, that is not hyperbole. Would love them to forget about God in this generation. But we have a story to tell and our God is bigger and we have prayers to pray. Would you stand? Would you stand? Let me ask you, maybe your story hasn't started with Jesus yet. Maybe you keep wanting to make your story start with something else. You keep going, well, my story is going to start when I do this. And my story is going to start when I, when I get old enough. My story is going to start when I land that job. My story is going to start when I get that relationship. What if your story started with Jesus today? What if your story started today with Jesus? And you're like, well, I'm only eight. I, it, I'm too young. Or I'm, I'm, I'm still just in elementary school. Or I'm still just in middle school or high school. I'm too young. No, you're not. No, you're not. I'm just a 32-year-old mom just trying to make ends meet. I, I don't know if I can do Jesus. Yes, you can. Yes, you can today. Well, maybe I'm in my 50s or my 60s and I've had hard news and I've been pushing back from God all my life. That was my dad's story. My dad kept pushing back and pushing back against the Lord until he got colon cancer. And he started asking questions. And he took a walk one day out on the bike path in the middle of Rapid City, South Dakota. And he passed three little old ladies because he called me afterwards and told me the story. I was walking the bike path and I saw these three little old ladies, Julie, and they weren't giving any thought to life or death at all. I think about death every single day. And I started to pray. And my dad had never said that before in his life. He said, I just gave my life to Jesus because I'm tired of pushing him away. And I need him. Maybe you've been pushing God away. Just, I'll, I'll get these other things in line and then I'll lean into God. And then my story will start. What if your story with Jesus starts today? What if you just say, here I am. Here I am. Jesus, I'm going to follow you. Help me to see you. Forgive me for how I've pushed you away. The shame that I keep doing this to. It's yours. Redeem it. Use it how you want. Because he will use it better than you could even ask or imagine. And then will you commit to pray? Maybe you'll take a portion of that, one of those Ephesians passages and you'll just do it. But let it start today with Jesus. Let's pray. Father, you have given us a story because you have given us yourself. And so today, whatever that is, wherever we're at, we first of all say, yes, Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me for pushing you aside. I want all of you today. I want all of you today. And I want to make you my Lord and my savior today. And for those of us who've decided to follow Jesus, man, help us to see the next generation. Help us to tell our story to them because the stakes are high. Help us to speak about the goodness of God any opportunity we get that we would speak about your goodness and that we would pray, that we would pray. Lord, we love you. We give all honor and glory to you today. God, speak into our hearts during this song. Speak into our lives what you would want to speak into us. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen.